Hello, my name is Thierry Nas, and I'm very delighted to participate to the 100th anniversary of the Cantuccino Institute. Today I will be talking about the importance of surveillance of resistance mechanism for public health. Here are my conflicts of interest. So AMR is a global health challenge, and this is probably something that you are aware of. There are numerous reports illustrating this um, phenomenon. There is one from Jean O'Neill who estimated that if nothing is done, by the year 2050, about 10 million people would die from AMR, and this would cost 100 tons of US dollar. And there is another report from uh, ECDC. This time it's not an estimation, but it's the counting of the infections that occurred in the year 2015, and they counted about 671,000 infections in the EU in 2015, and these infections led to 33,000 deaths. And 40% of those deaths were linked to carbapenem resistance. So multi-resistance is best illustrated by Escherichia coli because E. coli is our best friend. It participates to the homeostasis of the digestive tract. It also responds to the synthesis of some vitamins, but at the same time, it's our worst enemy. And 25% um, of the infections in humans are linked to E. coli. So E. coli, not so long ago, was multi-susceptible antibiotics. Then in the year 2000, E. coli producing ESBLs emerged, and basically these bacteria remained susceptible uh, constantly just to carbapenems. In the year 2010, um, carbapenem-resistant E. coli also emerged, and this was mostly due to the production of enzymes named carbapenemases. Third generation syphilis point resistance is already high in, in Europe. This is best illustrated in E. coli, who is a community based pathogen, and Klebsiella, who is a hospital based pathogen. In France, in the year 2018, there were 10% of the E. coli were resistant, and in Klebsiella, 30% um, of them were resistant to third generation syphilis points in bacteremia. And of course, there is always a gradient in Europe and in Italy, for instance, 29% of the E. coli were resistant to, to third generation syphilis points and in Greece up to 70.7%. And this is linked to the dissemination of one ESBL type, CTXM type enzymes. This has, of course, also consequences on the healthy carriage. And in Europe, uh, in the year 2012, about 6% of the European population, this is an average of course, was healthy carrier of these E. coli isolates producing ESBLs. And if you go on other continents such as Oasis Asia, already 70% of them were carriers. And this has of course consequences on tourism and on acquisition of these multi-drug resistant bacteria in countries where the prevalence is very high. And this was nicely shown by Etienne Rupé where he showed that 51% of the French tourists acquired uh, ESBLs abroad upon tourism. ESBL producers are now everywhere and this is probably a reason why we acquire them very easily. When we go abroad in countries where high prevalence is, uh, they are in livestock, they are in pets, they are in the environment, in animals and in insects, they are really everywhere and of course they are also in the food products that we eat. This has a consequence on the on carbapenem resistance. Of course, with these ESBLs, we increase use of carbapenems, and this leads also to carbapenem resistance. And this is again nicely illustrated in some countries in Europe, such as Italy. Thirty percent of the Klebsiella are resistant to carbapenems, and Greece, where we have almost two Klebsiella out of three that are resistant to carbapenems, and in Romania, where we have again twenty nine percent. Carbapenem resistance. In France, we have 0.5%, but even though we have a low prevalence, when we look at the epidemic curve, we see that we are in the beginning of the exponential growth of these bugs, and the number of, of uh, carbapenemase or carbapenem resistant isolates is increasing. And this has, of course, a clinical consequence because this carbapenem resistant antibacterial remains susceptible only to cholestine plus no novel molecules that are uh, commercialized, but basically this leads to pan resistance and of course to therapeutic dead ends. And this explains also why mortality rates 
with this bacteria are very high. Carbapenem resistant is something that we know for a long time, as soon as they have been used in, in human therapy. Carbapenem resistance has been uh, described, and this was mostly due to bacteria that produce an enzyme that does not hydrolyze carbapenems, but upon uh, impermeability problems, it may hydrolyze. Weakly carbapenems plus impermeability, it may lead to carbapenem resistance. And this has, of course, important issues in the treatment of these infections, but it has no epidemic dissemination because chromosomal mutations that lead to impermeability and overexpression of enzymes have an important fitness cause. This is, of course, not the case with carbapenemases because carbapenemases are usually associated with highly epidemic clones, so-called high-risk clones, and they're also carried by plasmids, which gives them the propensity to even spread faster. <coughs> when we look at the distribution of CPEs in France, we find the same carbapenemis as we find everywhere in, in Europe, OXA48, NDM, VIM, IMP, and KPC. Just the prevalence of these different mechanisms may change from one country to another, but we always find these five same delinquents. The important point for the countries is that <clears throat> in France, 25% of the carbapenemases are MPLs. And MBLs, right now, there are no treatment uh, available for MBLs. So this has an important consequence in terms of uh, therapy. <coughs> so where are these CPs? Of course, the CPs are again everywhere. The same bacteria that carry ESBLs are now carrying also uh, carbapenemases. So you find them in uh, animal of the food chain. Uh, in the pets, in countries where these enzymes are highly prevalent, and also in countries with low prevalence, such as Germany, they are already in the food chain here, for instance, in a pig farm. <coughs> so what can we do to prevent the 2050 scenario? Of course, there are things that we can do in the short term, and the things we can do in the short term is really identify CPEs in order to isolate the patients, in order to slow down hospital Diffusion. This has to be done either as a source of infection or as a source of gastrointestinal colonization, and we will see different tools we can use. At the short term, we have to limit antibiotic resistance by reducing uh, the consumption. Do we really need a uh, treatment? And using the right antibiotic, of course, for a combination. At the midterm, we need novel antibiotics and alternatives to antibiotics, but this is difficult to foresee. But again, for these limit antibiotic resistance and novel treatments, we need, again, rapid identification of resistance mechanism in order to be able to use the right antibiotic treatment. And then, of course, in the long term, we need to understand what is triggering this expansion and dissemination of these resistant genes. So why do we need to rapidly identify and detect CPEs? Of course, they are critical for infection control, for preventing the spread to critically ill patients in our hospitals. And this, of course, has consequences, which means um, rapid identification has to lead to implementing reinforced hygiene measures. The best would be to have dedicated staff, and even better would be to be able to court, if possible, colonized patients in a dedicated world. This has, of course, to be done on a risk-based assessment. Of course, it depends on the patient. Is the patient coming from an endemic area? Has the patient had antibiotic therapy? Is the patient... <clears throat> what is the local prevalence of um, carbapenem resistance in the country? And so on and so forth. <clears throat> but it also has an impact on um, the selection of antibiotic treatment. As I said, in France, MBLs corresponds to 25% of the antibiotics and novel targeted treatments such as uh, ceftazidine plus avibactam will not work on MBLs. So the fact to know that there is an MBL will make you think that you should not use this molecule because you may select another bacteria, uh, ceftazidine avibactam resistance. And also for antibiotic stewardship, um, 
it becomes more and more evident that um, patients that are colonized with CRE have in this study from session a one chance out of 10 to get infected with their CRE. And this will also help you to choose the right antibiotic to treat an infection in case uh, the patient is known to be a carrier. Then, of course, it's cost saving. It has you know, a few studies out there that have shown that if you detect the patient, if you isolate the patient, it's much cheaper than to cope with an epidemic situation. Then, of course, there is a reduced moral cost for CPE negative patients that are in preventive <coughs> excuse me, isolation. And also, it avoids reduced patient care while isolated because uh, when you're isolated, you have a delayed surgery, fibroscopy, x-ray. All these things are usually programmed at the end of the day when there is no other patients afterwards in order to prevent again uh, possible transmission. So are UCAS guidelines sufficient to detect CPEs? The answer is, of course, clearly no. Uh, you have the clinical breakpoints, but by using clinical breakpoints of 23 millimeters for Merapenem or UCAS 22 millimeters, <clears throat> you will miss almost 40% of the CPEs. So UCAS um, ended up by proposing uh, screening and detection of CPE diameter of 28, but even by using diameter of 28, you still miss 5% um, of the CPEs. So this is uh, a way to tell you which bacteria needs to be further screened, but it will not tell you whether there is a CPE or not. And this is just an example of the situation. Here you have six bacteria, three coli, three Klebsiella, Five are CPEs and one is a CRE. And of course, it's important to know which one is the CRE because the CRE is the bacteria that will probably not be so epidemic in your situation. And when you look at the antibiogram, it's impossible or almost impossible to tell which one is a CPE and which one is a CRE. So you need tools that helps you to rapidly identify which one is at risk and which one is not. Of course, these bacteria <coughs> were multi-drug resistant, but Sometimes CPEs are multi-susceptible, and this is the case of this E. coli isolate that has a diameter around uh, atapenem that is below 28, which leads you to screen for CPE. And when you look for CPE, you, know, you end up finding an OXA48, but it's almost impossible just by the antibiogram to know that this is an OXA48 producers. So we have no tools that allow you to rapidly confirm or more or less rapidly confirm the presence of uh, <coughs> carbapenemies. You have phenotypic tests, which are more or less good, such as the SIM test, carbapenem inactivation test. But all these tests require 24 hours, and 24 hours is already too long if you have to consider patient isolation. Then you have tests that are based on carbapenem hydrolysis. These tests be it uh, UV spectrophotometry, colorimetry, beta-carba, ph metry Malditov, or RSIM, are tests that are more or less rapid, less than uh, three hours. They have uh, uh, sensitivity and specificity that are variable. They have all limitations. And whichever test you decide to use, <clears throat> always keep in mind these limitations because according to these limitations, once you know your limitations, you can use these tests uh, quite accurately. Probably the tests that are the, the easiest to handle are immunochromatography, and we will come back to this. And for those that are a little bit richer, you can use molecular tests or DNA microarray. And for those that are very rich, you can use real-time sequencing with a nanopore, and you can get <coughs> results within one to six hours. Among these tests I have mentioned, I would just like to speak a few words on the RSIM test, which is a test that has been developed in Romania by um, Dr. Popa and, and uh, Alex and, and uh, Madalina Muntin. It's a test that is quite easy. It's based on the SIM hydrolysis, except that <clears throat> the monitoring of the, um, of the indicator E. coli strain is done by nephilometry 
and <clears throat> if the bacteria produces a carbapenemase, um, carbapenem present in the carbapenem disc is hydrolyzed and the uh, E. coli isolate can grow. Whereas if <coughs> whereas if uh, the bacteria does not produce a carbapenemase, carbapenem present in the disc is not hydrolyzed and thus the E. coli growth inhib inhibitor uh, indicator is not uh, height is not um, uh, is, is destroyed and then you don't, won't see any growth and basically by just looking at the growth growth means carbapenemase producers no growth means uh, no carbapenemase producer and this test is quite cheap has a good sensitivity and is relatively fast less than three hours but probably the the fastest and the easiest test to, to handle is immunochromatography you have um, a test that detects the five most prevalent carbapenemases with a high specificity, high sensitivity. Basically, you just take one colony, put it in a buffer, and then load it on, on, the, on, the, on the strip. And within <coughs> 15 minutes, you get the test results. It's affordable, it's rapid, it's simple. It really corresponds to to what you need and there are more tests that are developed for MCR1, VAN-A, VAN-B and, and so on and so forth. Of course, when you have um, a patient that is repatriated and you need to know whether this patient is colonized, then the strategy is different. You can do rectal uh, stool sampling or rectal swabbing and then you can play it on different media, chromogenic media, selective chromogenic media that allows you to select for carbapenem resistant bacteria and the different media out there that have good specificities and sensitivity. You can also decide to make an enrichment culture. This of course needs 24 more hours and you end up then having 48 hours to get colonies growing. And then once you have the colonies growing, you can do your favorite test to confirm the presence of a CP. But here, of course, when you have uh, rectal swaps, being able to rapidly identify a colonized patient is very important. And here you can use molecular tests and many tests out there now that can give you in one or two hours a rapid identification of the status. And then according to this, you can decide how you will handle this. So we have many tools now that allow us to rapidly screen for, for carriers. CPEs have a potential for rapid diffusion and outbreaks. This is something very easy. We have seen this in, in Italy within two years, you're from zero to 30%. And we have seen this in many hospitals in France. If you miss the first case, you may have rapidly 10, 20, 30 um, other cases, and then it becomes very difficult to, to handle this. The risk of cross-border transfer from endemic areas is very high. So you need to have an important um, surveillance system, you have to have rules that will uh, indicate who are the risk patients in, in each country and according to these risk patients you have to do uh, your testing. And then of course something we also have to monitor is that these carbapenem resistant genes are sometimes associated with high-risk clones and these high-risk clones need even more uh, attention because you really want to contain these high-risk clones. And of course, the one thing that uh, we are not, uh, we have to keep in mind is that we have those five main carbapenemases, but there are more carbapenemases waiting for their emergence. So we always have to keep an eye on the results. <clears throat> but for sure, it's difficult to forecast the evolution of all these. The scary scenario of 2050, it's a reality and we have still no clue on how to stop it. The thing we know is that screening becomes affordable, but uh, screening for screening is not uh, what we need to do. We need to do screening and do something behind the screening. We need, we need to isolate the patients, if possible, have dedicated staff. And the best would be to have a courting unit where we can court, uh, court these, these patients. Then of course, E. coli is a community-based pathogen and the fact that E. coli carbapenemase producing E. coli are emerging and are more and more prevalent 
is bad news because it means that these bacteria are spreading now in the community. And of course, one thing that we can ask is, <clears throat> will CPEs have the same expansion as ESBLs? Probably yes, because it's the same bacteria that carry both genes. So for sure, we need novel therapy strategies. Novel antibiotics are out there. Avibactam, Relibactam, many inhibitors. Cephidiocor is a new cephalosporin and so on the new molecules that are arriving. But we know already that um, resistance will appear and resistance may appear very rapidly. This was the case for Abibactam. So again, we need to identify very rapidly the resistance mechanism present in a bacteria in order to propose very rapidly the right antibiotic in order to save the antibiotics and keep these antibiotics as long as possible uh, in the susceptibility range. Thank you very much for your attention.